Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Um, in this uh, video, I'm just going to do a quick review of uh, James Hansen's most recent uh, letter, um, which came out uh, basically just at the end of uh, last year, uh, December 28th, uh, 2023. Um, okay, I don't like to miss posts from him because... Um, you know, he's one of the people who really understands uh, what's going on with our climate system. So this is um, from his uh, group, climatesciencewarenesssolutions.org, a group that he was involved in setting up. And so he says, young people do not underestimate your potential aided by the scientific method to change the world's course. And um, he wrote, or is in the process of writing a, a book called Sophie's Planet. Sophie is one of his grandchildren. And I'm looking forward to when it comes out. Hopefully it comes out soon. Although it's been supposedly, in quotes, coming out soon uh, for, for quite a while now. So this is the... Um, home page of this group, Climate Science Awareness Solutions org, and um, their mission, basically, um, they're working to halt the global march toward catastrophic climate change by a strategy that leads as rapidly as possible to a near universal carbon fee on fossil fuels. Um, and uh, yeah, so they basically um, you know, it's a good group. They're connected with the Citizens Climate Lobby, or they like what Citizens Climate Lobby is um, recommending with the carbon fee and dividend, you know, rising fee on fossil fuels, basically. And uh, so who's involved in this? Well, Hansen himself is uh, the director or team leader. So just a quick blurb on him. He was formerly the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, or GISS. He's an adjunct professor at Columbia University's Earth Institute. He directs a program on climate science, awareness, and solutions. So he's trained in physics and astronomy in the space science program of Dr. James Van Allen. So, you know, the, you've probably heard of the Van Allen belts. Um, ben Allen was at the University of Iowa, so he researched uh, clouds on Venus originally, Hansen, um, helped identify their composition as sulfuric acid. Um, but since the late 70s, he's focused his research on Earth's climate, especially human-made climate change. He's best known for his testimony on climate change to a congressional committee in the 1980s, I think it was 1988, it helped raise broad awareness of the global warming issue. Elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1995, was designated by Time Magazine in 2006 as one of the most 100 influential people on the planet. Okay, so he's done an awful lot of work. Um, he's recognized for speaking truth to power, doesn't hold back. He identifies ineffectual policies as greenwash, and he outlines actions that the public must take to protect the future of young people and other life on our planet. And there's a lot of different contact information, his CV, uh, he's on Twitter, doesn't post a lot, but posts some important things as a Facebook page um, and his, uh, you know, his, his web page. And then he's got a team of people um, who co-write letters and articles with him. Um, there's, there's a team of different people that are involved with the Climate Science Awareness and Solutions Institute. Um, there's also a um, uh, board of directors, uh, Barry McGibbon's on there, um, Jeffrey Sachs is on there, so different people from Columbia. Um, university. And, uh, you know, there's a good section here on climate science. So it's a good overview of some of the work 
and videos um, that have been done. So there's the Global Warming in the Pipeline paper, um, Young People's Burden, Requirement of Negative CO2 Emissions. You know, we can't just stop emissions at this stage. We need negative CO2 emissions. We need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Regional climate change across the US, um, ice melt, sea level rise, and superstorms. Very, some very, very classic papers. There's good references to them, and you can join their uh, newsletter. Um, so anyway, this is his um, Columbia website. If you just Google James Hansen Columbia, um, you can see his website. And he just posted on December 28th a, an article, Good News for Young People about climate change and a thank you. Okay, um, so this is the article here. So let's have a look at this. Okay, so there's a couple uh, plots here. So this is CO2 rise parts per million per year that we've been experiencing. This is uh, what we would expect from fossil fuel uh, CO2 emissions, or this is what we produce from CO2 fossil fuel emissions. Um, if it all went into the air, we'd be rising over 10 ppm per year. We're not, we're rising uh, at rates somewhere down here. You know, this is 2 ppm per year, this is 3 here, this is the, the uh, rise here, the blue line. We hit over 3, you know, one year. Okay, um, the seven year moving average, I believe, uh, is the blue line here. Okay, is the, this the enveloped curve in the blue? So that's what's going into the atmosphere. So what's disappearing, we know the emissions very well. You need to, if you subtract what we see going into the air, there's the rest is the yellow. That CO2 is disappearing CO2. It's disappearing from this state of from from the perspective of the atmosphere okay so where is it going well it's being absorbed into the oceans and it's being taken up by land on land by vegetation into the soils etc um, on this scale is emissions in gigatons of carbon per year because there's a very simple conversion factor one ppm of co2 is equivalent to about 2.12 gigatons of, of carbon Okay, so that's how this scale can be lined up to this scale. Now, the fraction of CO2 that is going into the air is thus the, the ratio. Okay, and it's the blue line here. This is the annual variability, the black line, the annual mean, and the seven-year average of the blue line takes out the higher frequency spikes and shows um, of, of the black line rather takes out the high frequency spikes gives us the blue line and the top of the blue area is the seven year mean and you can see that you know we were pushing up to 60 percent of of what was emitted was being captured by the ocean and land not going into the atmosphere that's declined uh to um about uh you know over here closer to 50%, okay? So the oceans and the land are taking up lots of CO2, you know, and if they weren't, if we hadn't, didn't have this decline from about 60% going to the atmosphere to about 50%, CO2 levels would be much, much higher in the atmosphere right now, and we'd be in, in much, much worse shape than we're in right now, if you can imagine that. Okay, um, so the work of Hansen, you know, so he's saying here, this is a year end post, good news for young people about climate change and a thank you. So of course the work from Hansen is quite different from that of mainstream, you know, other people in the mainstream because they, their research uh, places comparable emphasis on paleoclimate information, global climate modeling, and the model observations of ongoing climate change. Most uh, mainstream work relies too much on global climate modeling, not enough and, or not at all on paleoclimate 
and they kind of ignore what's ongoing. They don't update very quickly. So despite the findings from the Hansen groups that climate sensitivity is greater than the estimate of three degrees Celsius equilibrium warming for doubled CO2, that's the mainstream view, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change number, they've determined that it's much higher than that. In fact, it's 4.8 plus or minus 1.2 Celsius much higher than the three degree C best estimate for the IPCC. Okay, also global warming is accelerating. Global warming is accelerating due to the reduction of human made aerosols, especially that in shipping fuels, but also emissions from China have less sulfur. Okay, so we're getting a huge acceleration of warming. So Betsy Taylor, who's the president of the board of this group I just showed you, the Climate Science Awareness and Solutions group, asked if there's any good news to counter pessimism from our findings that climate sensitivity is much higher than the, than the IPCC number, it's 4.8 versus 3. Global warming is accelerating because of the reduction of human-made aerosols. So what they're doing is basically, so this is some good news here that the fraction of the CO2 that, uh, from the uh, fossil fuel emissions that are going into the atmosphere has actually been reducing slightly over the years. Um, so this is, uh, you know, offset some of the warming that would have occurred if this didn't happen. Okay, but we expect as the oceans continue to warm and stratify that this number, this fraction, this, this curve will turn and start moving upward and we'll get more and more of the CO2 in the atmosphere unless, you know, because the oceans will be saturated. So what they do is they prefer, they present new evidence of nature's ability to help clean up human pollution in the climate system specifically nature's ability to rapidly absorb a large part of the CO2 that humanity is injecting into the air by burning fossil fuels. Okay, there's long been a so-called carbon cycle mystery or a missing carbon sink. Um, fossil fuel emissions are known quite accurately, which is, which is the upper curve here, um, increasing by a factor of four. Okay, they were two point, we had about 2.5 gigatons of carbon emitted in 1960, and that's increased to about 10 in the last few years, an increase of four. But the amount of carbon appearing in the air is not more than half. It's the blue area of, of this figure, okay? And um, uh, so it's actually the fraction ending up in the atmosphere has actually decreased over the past few decades. And you can see it was pushing up to about 60 and then there has been a large drop and it's been decreasing. Um, so it's about, you know, 50% instead of 60%. Okay, so less is going into the atmosphere. So you could argue that this is a, a good thing. This was unexpected. The problem uh, was that for this missing carbon cycle mystery, the missing carbon sink, is was that most expert estimates for the ocean and land sinks for increased atmospheric CO2 did not add up to the magnitude of the disappearing CO2, especially after estimates were included for the additional carbon source from deforestation. So there's a new paper out, which I'll discuss in a separate video, is a new paper by Wang et al. in 2023, um, they use data-driven analysis of the carbon, oxygen, and phosphorus cycles in the ocean. They account for all known export pathways for carbon, and they obtain greater advective diffusive downward transport of biological carbon than, than that found in more conventional global climate modeling. Okay, so it turns out that the deep ocean is taking up that missing carbon. It's the reason why the, you know, there's less carbon in the air than there would be otherwise is because we more is going into the deep oceans than we thought. Um, okay, so the upshot is that the deep ocean may provide a little more help in taking up excessive atmospheric CO2 than most models have been indicating. 
but the conclusions are not, aren't altered in the global warming in the pipeline paper because that uses the empirical carbon cycle data. Okay, uh, this is carbon intensity. So countries are using more and more, uh, burning more and more fossil fuels, producing more and more carbon. But if you look at the energy out, if you look at the carbon intensity ratio, which is the carbon emissions per unit energy use, or it's, a, it's sort of an, an efficiency, you know, um, the units are um, megatons of oil equivalent. Basically, uh, the carbon intensity in megatons of carbon over megatons of oil equivalent to the carbon intensity has actually been decreasing over the years. The global average is here. You know, it's been dropping. This is about 0.8. That's maybe about, arguably, about 0.7, okay? So, although we're burning more and more carbon, we're putting more and more um, CO2 in the atmosphere, etc., where the amount of energy produced is larger, um, is, is, is larger, um, okay? We're not putting as much carbon in the atmosphere per um, energy that we produce from burning the carbon. So we've made progress in reducing the carbon intensity of the energy, i.e. the carbon emissions per unit energy use. It's declined from a bit less than 0.8 to a bit less than 0.7. Um, okay, so, so this is good, but it's small potatoes compared to the total CO2, which is going in the atmosphere, which is what the climate cares about. Right, global carbon emissions are the product of carbon intensity and energy use. Global energy use is still rising. Much of the world is in the process of raising their living standards. So, so this is a new figure, which shows, it, so basically it normalizes fossil fuel emissions to 1997, the year of the Kyoto Protocol, if you recall that. Global emissions have increased about 50% since 1997. And uh, you can see these annual CO2 emissions normalized, and you can see this is globally, uh, if we were 1 in 1997, we're, we're over 1.5, maybe 1.6. So we've increased about 50% at least since 1997 globally. There's no sign of the very st steep increase, decrease that would be needed to keep global warming, you know, under control, basically. So you can see how the rise has been much larger in China and in India, these developing countries. This is a global average, you know, rushes here in increase and, and many other countries are actually showing a decrease, the UK, Germany. And then uh, here's another view, uh, you know, again, we have the global curves, the black curve here, and you have, um, you know, Africa is is a dark green um, or Africa, rest of Europe, Eurasia declining, Canada, you know, gone up slightly, Australia, similar path to, to Canada. Okay, I forgot to point out the US over here is actually shown a drop. Okay, um, okay, so th that's those are some sort of positive things, but they're basically you know, being outweighed uh, by, you know, the um, rapid acceleration of climate change that we're, we're seeing. So Hansen and his group, they're grateful for the unusual level of support they got in 2023. They finished the pipeline paper, a two plus year project. Um, there's going to be a paper soon, an upcoming communication on the Cenozoic analysis which is a paleoclimate analysis, um, which is very important to, to look at. And most people don't look at that. Like I say, it's not in the, it's not in, it's not in the eyes of the policy makers. It's not being considered. They write, they're relying almost exclusively on, on the computer modeling, which we know is incorrect. Um, of course, clouds are a huge challenge because of the roles, both of climate feedback and a climate forcing. Right, the the high climate sensitivity, the four point eight plus or minus one point two number, 
Um, it implies that clouds provide a large amplifying climate feedback, but cloud changes also provide the mechanism by which aerosol changes cause a large climate forcing. So clouds are, are complicated, right? Cloud feedbacks are complicated, but but they're, uh, you know, they're being understood better and better. So the expectation for this year, continued unusual global warming will provide empirical evidence of the strong acceleration of global warming. It'll become probably undeniable in the next six to six months to a year. Um, so the goal of Hansen and his group is to complete work that helps provide understanding of ongoing climate change and actions that are needed to avoid unacceptable consequences for young people and future generations. And uh, there's just a little bit here about the people working with Hansen and his group and about the CSAS group at Columbia University. Okay, with uh, some links and et cetera, et cetera. And this is the paper that's referred to uh, by Hansen showing that uh, more carbon is going into the deep oceans. And um, I basically have that paper here, which I'll talk about separately. Okay, so thank you for listening. And uh, it's really... Um, it's really not advisable. I mean, if you want to keep on top of climate change, global warming acceleration, why it's happening, make sure that you don't miss, make sure that you catch all of the work from James Hansen and his group. And like I say, I'm really looking forward to Sophie's Planet when his next book comes out. I remember reading um, his one of his previous books from a number of years ago now called Storms of Our Grandchildren, which if you haven't read, by the way, I would highly recommend that you pick up a copy and read Storms of Our Grandchildren by James Hansen from several years ago, because Sophie's Choice, I think, is going to give us a good update and probably be written similar along similar lines to Storms of Our, of Our Grandchildren. Okay, so anyway, thanks again for listening. Please consider going to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and donating to my PayPal to support my research and videos. And uh, once again, uh, you know, happy, happy 2024. Okay, bye for now.